so this session is technically two hours long. I don't think it will take two hours long, um, but uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. Okay, so um, today's session, um, I'm going to start off giving you a, a brief PowerPoint presentation, probably about 20 minutes, um, just giving a little history of our company. Um, some of you may know us already, so it might be a bit of revision. You may have heard it before. Um, but for those of you that are new to the Aurox technology, hopefully this will um, explain a little bit about where our company has come from and a little bit about how our technology works. Then there'll be a brief pause in the middle where I need to just swap the cameras and microphones around to the computer where the instrument is located. And then I'll proceed with the live demonstration. So as I say, answer, uh, ask me any questions as we go along using the chat folder and I'll try and get to all of your queries. Okay, so let me just bring up my PowerPoint. So uh, as I say, I'm going to start with a brief PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to take you through the history of our company, um, a little bit about the Aurox technology and how it works. Then I'm going to introduce to you um, two of our products, the Clarity LFC, where LFC stands for Laser Free Confocal, and also the Clarity HS. I'll talk to you a little bit about the software and give you a few imaging examples, and then we'll go ahead and show you the instrument working live. So here's a, here's a picture of the Aurox team. We're a, a, a small company based in Oxfordshire in the UK. Um, the founders of our company are, are very well respected in the field of imaging and microscopy. So these gentlemen sit on our board of directors and they help us day to day with developing our technology. Um, so firstly, on the left, we have Dr. Remus Juskaitis, who's the head of technology. He's a co-founder of Aurox and runs our research and development department. So he's responsible for the design of all our instrumentation, as well as designing all our software. So for over 20 years, he was part of the scanning optical microscopy group at the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford, where he developed a number of advanced optical microscopy techniques. Um, you will be hearing from him um, later on in the schedule of our conference. I think he's going to be talking about uh, the, the woes of uh, objective lenses, how to choose a good objective lens. Then we have Professor Tony Wilson. Um, he's also one of the directors on our board and one of the co-founders. He's the general editor of the journal Microscopy and former president of the Royal Microscopical Society and also past master of the Worshipful Company of Scientific Instrument Makers. Um, his work has been recognized by numerous awards and prizes, including honorary fellowship of the Royal, Royal Microscopical Society. And he's also a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, you might want to look up the RMS podcasts called The Microscopists. There's a really nice interview between Peter O'Toole um, and Tony Wilson, where Tony discusses his history as well as his pastimes on his ranch in America. Um, we also have Professor Martin Booth. Um, Martin is Senior Research Fellow at the University of Oxford. He's based jointly in the Centre for Neural Circuits and Behaviour in the Department of Engineering Science. Um, he works on new technology for microscopy, um, so he's working on things like adaptive optics. Um, and he also um, runs a company called Obsidia. Um, and then there's Professor Mark Neal. Um, Mark is Professor in Photonics at Imperial College London, where his research concentrates on a wide range of imaging and microscopy techniques, including fluorescence microscopy um, and their application across multiple disciplines. Um, Mark has been um, integral in the development of our new product, which I'll show you tomorrow, uh, the Unity Confocal, where he's uh, done a lot of work on the hardware, the electronics, as well as the software. So a brief history of Aurox. Some of you may not have heard of our company before, um, but we've been around for quite a long time and we've developed quite established technology. So we were founded in 2004 as an Oxford University spin-out company. Um, and the, the co-founders, so Tony, Mark, Martin and Remus, um, developed a technology based on structured illumination for sectioning. They first developed uh, an instrument called the Optigrid. Now, this is the technology on which the Zeiss Apatome is based. So you may well have used the Apatome or seen it in your laboratories. So that is based on, on the technology uh, developed by Aurox. 
We then went on to develop a spinning disc version of this, um, along with Zeiss, uh, the Zeiss Viva Tome. Um, it's sadly now been discontinued. It's very old now, but there are still quite a few out there being used. Um, and for this uh, instrument, we won uh, a R&D 100 award in 2010, which was quite a prestigious award. We then went on to work with Andor, um, and we developed the Revolution DSD range. So again, some of you may have heard of the Andor Revolution DSD or the DSD2. Um, we won another couple of awards for this technology as well. We also worked with a company called 3D Histech. Um, our technology is inside their panoramic confocal slide scanner. And our technology is also inside this, the Zeiss SmartProof 5 confocal. Um, so you'll see up until about 2017, uh, we were developing and designing and manufacturing instrumentation for other companies as an OEM uh, manufacturer. So our branding never appeared on any of the instruments. Um, and we de decided in uh, 2017 that we'd start direct sales to researchers and to companies. And this would give us uh, better access so we could talk to people about their needs and develop the products um, uh, in a more seamless way rather than going through a third party. So at that point, we released the Aurox Clarity, the LFC version, and we also uh, released our own software called Visionary. And that's when I came on board and also Lee, who's on, on the call as well. So we went on to develop then a high speed version of the Clarity LFC. And more recently, we've developed Unity, which I'll talk to you about tomorrow. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the technology. How does it work and, and why is it useful? So first of all, all our products are laser-free confocal. So why, why would you choose a laser-free system? Um, so firstly, you have a lower initial purchase price. You, you don't have to buy lasers. You just buy a simple LED illuminator. So this could be um, an LED or, in fact, a metal halide lamp. Um, and you could use a laser if you wanted to, but I'll explain why that's not advisable a bit later. Also, LED systems are much more compact. We don't need these big um, lasers and the big power supplies that come with them. So we can make our system much smaller. It's a really flexible configuration. and I'll show you a few examples of how we can upgrade almost any microscope. And this allows us to reuse old or legacy microscopes, although we do support all the new models as well. The fact of using an LED means that you don't have any expensive service contracts. There's very little maintenance and there's very little downtime. The, uh, the LED illuminators nowadays are extremely reliable and extremely long lived. So really, once you set up your system, you can just let it run. Also, you don't have to worry about laser safety or specialist training. Anyone can use the system. Uh, the LED light sources as well tend to be uh, in um, conjunction with the spinning disc technology, um, tend to be much gentler on your sample. So you tend to get lower photo bleaching and lower phototoxicity. This is a little sample dependent, um, but in general, this can be um, assumed. Now, one different thing about our spinning disc technology is that we don't have any artifacts um, because our grid is spinning. Um, so compared with static structured illumination systems um, for sectioning, we don't get any artifacts from taking multiple images. And also it's very fast compared to other grid sectioning methods. Um, but in, in general, it performs very, very similarly to a spinning disc confocal microscope that you might have come across before that may use a laser. So now I'd like to just make a brief comparison between our spinning disc confocal microscopes and a traditional laser-based spinning disc um, confocal microscope. So a lot of you may have come across spinning disc confocals uh, that use a Nipkov disc. So this is, for example, the Yokogawa type technology. So a traditional Nipkov spinning disc um, has a number of pinholes arranged around a disc which is spinning. And we're all very happy that spinning disc confocal is a very gentle technique um, and it's very fast. Um, however, a Nipkov spinning disc rejects about, um, well, in this paper that um, Remus and Tony and Mark um, published back in 1996, they measured the light throughput of a Nipkov spinning disc. 
and they measured it to be less than 1% of the incident light actually reaches your sample. Um, this means that you need lasers just to get enough light to illuminate your sample. Um, this has got a little bit better now. I would say most modern pinhole spinning disk systems will get about 5 to 7% light throughput, but it's still quite low. You're still wasting a lot of your illumination. The Aurox spinning disk, instead of having pinholes, has a, a grid-like structured illumination pattern on it. Um, so instead of tiny pinholes, we almost have like a letterbox-shaped aperture repeated across the disk. And this is arranged in a light, dark, light, dark pattern. And this means we get about 50% of light throughput through our disk. So even with a very good Nipkov spinning disk with 5 or 7% light throughput, we're still getting 10% more light throughput. And this just means we don't need a laser. Um, we have had researchers use laser illuminators, um, but the first thing we have to do is put in neutral density filters, turn the laser right down, because they're just too bright for our system. So LED is all you need. So this little um, uh, graphic is just to try and explain to you how we achieve a laser-free confocal image. And I'll explain it a little bit more detail when we go to the instrument itself. So on the left, if you can see my cursor, we have a white light source. So as I say, this could be an LED, a metal halide lamp, or indeed a laser if you so wish. This white light source gives us our excitation light. This passes through a, a filter to give us the, the correct wavelength that we want. And then this passes through our spinning disk. This projects a grid pattern into the focal plane of our study sample, of our, of our um, region of interest, into the focal plane. And then your fluorophores are excited and they emit light. Now this light passes back to the disk. About half of the light passes through the disk, and we put this light onto the left-hand side of an S-CMOS detector. So this detector could be from Hamamatsu or PCO or Andor or Photometrics. Um, so we use half of the CMOS detector to collect this portion of light. This portion of light that's gone through the disk we call the transmitted light, and this contains our confocal section. But it also, because we have a very high light throughput, um, it also contains about 50% of our outer focus light. So we have our confocal section and 50% of the blurred information. The back of our spinning disk is a mirror, it's reflective. So any light that can't pass through the disk is reflected off the back of it. We collect that light as well, and we put that onto the right-hand side of our SCMOS detector. We call this the reflected light. So our transmitted light has our confocal plus the blur. And the right-hand side, our reflected light, contains the rest of the blur. So we've split our image in half. And how do we get our confocal signal out? We do a simple subtraction of one half to the other. So we um, subtract the blur from one side from the blur from the other side. Um, to do this, we need a very, very um, precise calibration routine. Um, however, this is taken care of inside our software. So there's an alignment procedure you do when you install the instrument, and then there is a, a calibration algorithm that matches these two halves of the detector together. And then we do this registration and subtraction process to extract our confocal image. Now, I know that this is quite complicated, so if anybody wants me to go through it again later, um, I, I'll be happy to do so. So the instrument that I'm going to be introducing you to today is called the Clarity LFC, where LFC stands for laser-free confocal. This is designed to be a small add-on to any wide-field microscope to convert it into a fluorescence confocal spinning disk microscope. The Clarity LFC has three different patterns on the spinning disk, so you can choose between light throughput or sectioning. Um, you can image with the system in confocal, wide field, or bright field mode. So you can imagine your, you do your subtraction for your confocal imaging. If you don't do the subtraction, you still have your traditional wide field image. So this is really useful if you have samples where it's very difficult to find your cells, 
Um, so you can use the wide field imaging for navigating around. And then with one click, you switch to confocal. And I'll show you that when we go to the live demonstration. The Clarity LFC can do fast imaging up to 50 frames per second. That's 50% a, a, um, of the field of view of the camera. It's really, really easy to add onto your microscopes. You can move it around different microscopes. Um, you can share it within a facility. And it's extremely easy to use. I'll show you the software a bit later, and you'll see how easy it is. I'll also discuss in a little while that it's compatible with a wide range of detectors, light sources, and microscopes. So you really can upgrade any microscope you might have in your lab. It's also designed to be very affordable with almost zero running costs. To complement this product, um, we also launched in March 2018 the Clarity HS. So HS stands for high speed, and this will allow you to image up to 100 frames per second with a suitable camera. So you might want to have, for example, the Hamamatsu Orca Flash 4 camera with the camera link connection, which will allow you to image at 100 frames per second. Um, there's also a PCO high speed camera as well that works very well with this configuration. Essentially, it looks exactly the same. It's the same size, the same format, and the same flexibility. It just allows you to access this higher speed. So here's just a few examples of different configurations where we've used the Clarity LFC or the Clarity HS. And as you can see, it will fit on lots of different microscopes. So it will fit on all of the big four manufacturers' microscopes, so Nikon, Olympus, Zeiss, and Leica. And we can support in our software approximately two to three generations back. So if you do have an old microscope, it's definitely worth talking to us and we can probably help you to upgrade it. Um, so on the left hand side at the top, um, you can see that here is an example of a system being used for electrophysiology on an upright microscope. Um, the middle um, image uh, at the top is on a cryofluorescence microscope. And if you um, attended the previous session on cryofluorescence, you will have seen that it will fit on an inverted or upright microscope now for cryofluorescence. And we have um, integrated the Linkam motorized uh, cryo stage into our software for that purpose. On the top right hand side, you can see that we can also put our instrument on a macroscope or a stereo microscope. So this is, this is really good because it's so small and compact, we can even put it onto, onto these microscope systems where um, perhaps weight is an issue on the, on the motorized Z drive. On the bottom, there are probably more standard configurations on an inverted microscope. But again, you can see that we support all the models from all the different manufacturers and various ages of equipment. To note here as well, You'll see that we're using cameras from Hamamatsu, Photometrics, PCO. Um, and we can also use light sources from Kuled, LuminCore, et cetera. So we're very, very varied in our support um, for different configurations. Now, I mentioned um, ease of use. Now, uh, most of our ease of use of the system, as well as it being small and um, laser free, so you don't need any extra training. Um, we developed the Aurox Visionary software to be very simple, so anybody can use it, a student or a biologist. Um, you don't need an advanced knowledge of confocal microscopy to pick up our system and use it. Um, most people, when they first see the software, they're surprised at how different it looks to traditional confocal microscopy software. But within five minutes, they're using it on, the, on their own unaided. Um, so just to drill down into some of the features, which again, I'll show you a little bit later. Um, all of the features, there's a large viewing window on the left hand side, which will show your images. Um, and on the right hand side, we have a flow chart of operations. So everything is very visual um, and color coded. So at the top, you just simply click to uh, choose your file name and file path where you want to choose your, uh, to save your data. The next tab down, is for XY navigation. So this is where you can set up a tile scan, for example. The next tab down is where you would set up your Z stack. Then you can choose 
your confocal or wide field mode selection. And I'll explain a little bit more about that when we come into the live demonstration. Below that, you can see these colored boxes. That's where you choose your channels. And then below that is your time lapse settings. So going from the top, it's very simply X, Y, Z, Lambda, T. So as long as you remember that order, you're probably not going to get lost in this software. There are also some settings down the bottom where you can choose your exposure time, your light source intensity settings, and things like camera binning and camera averaging. And there are also some advanced settings in the background, so you can set up more complex experiments. If our software is too simple and too limiting for you, then we also have support in uh, Micromanager and Metamorph. Um, so uh, if, you, if you find that you don't want such a simple uh, graphical user interface and you want to do more complex experiments, the flexibility is there for you. Um, also to note, um, the, at Oxford University, the group at Micron in the biochemistry department um, have a software package called Cockpit, which I think will be introduced in one of the talks later this week, um, where they also support our, our instrument. So now I just want to show you a few images just to show you uh, the uh, capability of, of the system very briefly. So this is a video that was kindly produced uh, for us by our friends at DR Vision who have now been uh, bought by Leica. Um, so this is with the IVIA software, just showing the difference between the wide field image and the laser free confocal image. This is a really nice slide that um, is supplied by um, a group at Clemson University. So it's a section of sheep muscle. Um, and it's really nice uh, slide for showing um, your confocal resolution. Um, also, as well as tissue, we can um, get down to subcellular resolutions. Oh, I seem to have a little glitch in the middle of this video. Apologies. Um, so this is just the um, slide that you can acquire from Thermo Fisher. And then just to show how easy it is to use for large specimens as well, this is a, a large tile scan of a, a mouse kidney section. So you can see the scale bar on the bottom left of this image is 100 microns. So this was um, something like 20 by 20 um, tile scan at 60x oil immersion. So it's very, very easy to quickly achieve large um, images. And this is one of um, our favorite images. Um, this is uh, collected by Jakub Matila at the University of Helsinki. Um, so this is a Drosophila mid-gut. Um, and they were really impressed with the speed that they could take such a large tile scan. So this is a four channel, 50 tile image with four slices per, per stack. Um, and they took it in a, around eight minutes, which was much, much faster than they could achieve before with a, with a laser scanning confocal. And just to show that um, you can also take high speed imaging. Um, so this uh, image was taken um, or provided to us by Dr. Alex Corbett, who again will be speaking at, later in the conference. So this is an optically sectioned sea worm labeled with GCAMP. So they were doing calcium imaging with this um, using the high speed mode. And then this is a, a a nice video that uh, I created uh, with the help of Mika Runala. I hope he's on this call um, from ICIT um, in Germany. So Mika is one of our distributors. So this is a, a mouse brain slice that first of all was imaged with a, a 10x 0.3 NA dry objective in phase contrast and with Alexa 594. And this video just shows us zooming in and in then we swap to a 60x 1.4 NA oil immersion objective, and we keep zooming in and in on this image. And then we swap to uh, an image where we have analyzed a small region of interest with 3D SURF. So this is the SURF algorithm provided um, by the Ricardo Enriquez lab. Um, now, if you're interested in this sort of post-processing of our data, then Mika will be talking later in the week about um, how you can use the Aurox clarity and really push the limits of what's possible with, with the data from our system. So I want to finish up with the um, PowerPoint presentation here. 
and, and just summarize, and then it will take me a few minutes to swap over to the instrument. But in summary, um, our equipment is all laser free. Even though you might not have heard of our, our instruments and our company, it's extremely established technology with a long history um, where we've been providing these instruments to um, other companies for them to sell. The Clarity LFC provides you with a very flexible upgrade solution to any microscope you might have in your lab. And it's very, very easy to use. So anyone can use it from, from a, a, a project student right up to a professor. But also, even though it's very small and compact and easy to use, you get great resolution confocal images. And here are just a few um, testimonials and, and comments from some of uh, the people that have used our instruments um, from all around the world. Um, so if you are at all interested in their experiences, I think they'll be more than happy for you to contact them um, directly and discuss the technology with them. Um, but just to say that we've got some fantastic uh, results in, in, in different labs around the world. Okay, So this is the setup that I have here in our, in our demo room. Um, as you can see, we have our Clarity uh, laser-free confocal system attached to a Nikon TIE microscope. So I just need to move around the camera. Um, so the, the system itself just fits onto um, any uh, C-mount where you would fit a camera. So any camera port on your microscope. So that could be on an inverted microscope like this one or indeed on an upright like I showed in the presentation. So it's sitting here. Um, we have a small door on the front, and this allows us to access our filter cube turret. So there are four positions for filters in there, and they can be single band filter cubes, or in fact, dual band, quad band, um, whatever you prefer. And then I will, I'll move in a little bit closer in a second to show you the, uh, the instrument zoomed in a little bit. Um, so we just have an old Nikon TIE um, non-fluorescence microscope here. It has a motorized Z. And we have a prior ProScan um, XY stage fitted to it as well. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so you can see a bit more detail. OK. So now you can see the instrument itself. Um, so as I say, it's connected to the um, camera port here. And I'll just talk you through where the light is going inside the instrument. So we have a cool LED P300 LED light source fitted on the back of the instrument. And we have a Hamamatsu Orca Flash 4 V3 camera fitted here. Now, as I said before in the, in the talk, this could be any LED or metal halide um, lamp that you want from LumenCore or any, anybody else. Um, and this camera could be from Hamamatsu, PCO, Photometrics, etc. So just to explain where the light's going, and you saw it on the diagram where I explained where the, the light was going to the disk. So we illuminate from the LED lamp here, and the light will go through an excitation filter. And I'll show you the filter cubes in a little while. So it goes through an excitation filter to choose your wavelength of interest. And then it comes to the disc, which is located here. So it's spinning within the instrument here. Then the light goes up to your sample. So that's projecting that spinning structured illumination pattern in the focal plane of your, of your sample. That excites the fluorophores, and the light comes back down from the microscope back into the instrument. The transmitted light goes back through the disc, through an emission filter in the filter cube and onto one side of the CMOS camera. The light that doesn't manage to pass through the disk reflects off the back of the disk, passes through an identical emission filter, and is projected onto the other side of the camera. Now, because the um, light paths are split on the emission side, um, we have this uh, filter cube. You can see that it has um, one exciter light path and two emission light paths. This is one, one is for the transmitted light, one is for the reflected light. So they come through the same wavelength of emission filter, but two separate light paths onto the camera. 
And the filter cubes are extremely easy to um, put in um, and replace. So um, you, can, you can change your fluorophores, you can change your filter sets as you wish. Okay. Um, just a small highlight, um, if you remove this cover, there's a small lever to allow you to remove the camera. And there are some alignment um, ports here for when you want to realign the system. And we use those during the installation to make sure that the system is aligned and that the two images are coming to the camera in the correct way. Okay. So I'm happy to answer any questions or maybe Remus and Lee can answer any questions on the hardware. Um, and I will uh, change to sharing my screen and I will run you through the software. Okay. Oh, maybe not. Maybe I shall show just a window. There we go. Okay. Just going to check what works, what doesn't. Oh, I remember this didn't work properly. Okay. Two seconds. Entire screen. Okay. So some things show up when you're sharing a screen and some things show up when you're uh, uh, sharing the um, window itself. Okay. So this is the Aurox Visionary software. And um, when I say that the system is extremely easy to use, this is this is the interface that you'll be faced with. As I say, we also um, have drivers and device adapters for Micromanager, and there is an implementation in Metamorph as well as the Oxford University cockpit software. So um, if you find that this software doesn't do exactly what you want, for example, the FRAP imaging, I think that would have to be done in, in Micromanager or Metamorph. Okay, so when you open up our software, you're first um, shown this screen. So this is our hardware setup screen. And this is where we choose which instruments are attached to our Clarity Confocal Unit. So as you can see, it's like a schematic diagram looking from the top. So we have the Clarity LFC in the middle. We have the camera on the left. We have the light source at the top. And we have the microscope on the right hand side. And if we had a different light source attached, for example, I could just click on this pull down menu and I can choose another manufacturer's light source or another model of light source. So you can see we have a number of supported light sources here. And this is not an, exhausted, uh, an exhaustive list. We do support even more um, systems than this. And on the camera side of things, as you can see, we support the Orca Flash 4, but this is also includes the, the LT version. It's the V2 and the V3. Um, the PCO Edge, we also support the PCO Edge 4.2 SCMOS. Um, the Prime BSI, the Prime 95B, and also the Andor cameras. Um, in, with respect to microscopes, we supply, uh, we support microscopes from all the four major manufacturers. So Nikon, Leica, Olympus, and Zeiss. And as you can see, we go back a couple of generations in each case, as well as supporting the modern um, microscope. If you have a manual microscope that doesn't have a motorized Z drive, then we also have a solution for that. You can use um, a Z um, driver from a prior, for example or from Thor Labs. And we also support the uh, Piezo drives, so the Piezo nose pieces, and things like this. So um, as you can see, the software is extremely flexible in what we can do. Um, also, we support motorized X, Y stages from various Marshauser, um, ITK, Prior, and some of the proprietary ones as well. So in this screen as well, you would choose which filter cubes you have installed in the turret and in which position. But if everything's set up in your installation and you never cho change anything, then you just come into this screen, make sure everything turns green. Everything will be red when you first switch it on. It will connect in a couple of seconds, turns green, and then you're ready to proceed. I just want to show you very, very briefly how um, we are creating our confocal image. It's a bit easier to see in the software than it is in the PowerPoint presentation. 
So if I just um, turn on the light, for example, let's go to a green channel. This is a very, very bright sample, so I need to turn everything down. OK. So this is an image um, of a mouse kidney. It's actually the, the same one that we did the tile scan on um, in, the, in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and what I've done here is I'm just showing a raw image from the SCMOS camera. So if you look closely, you can see on the left hand side, we have these bright pixels. And, and on the right hand side, we don't have those bright pixels. And also, if you look closely, you'll see that these are two mirror images of one another. So the left hand side is a mirror image of the right hand side. So this is where we've split the image in two. So the left hand side is what we call the transmitted light. So this is the light that's gone through the disk and back through the disk. And on the right hand side, this is our reflected light. So this is the light that's gone through the disk, reflected off the back of the disk and then gone to the camera. And it's very important that the left hand side is brighter than the right hand side. So these bright pixels correspond to our confocal signal. They're the bits we want. How we match up each half of the camera is we, we come into this view. I just turn on a calibration pattern. So we have an internal LED inside the system. And this LED is uh, shining light through a mask onto each half of the camera. And Basically, we have a pattern on the left and a pattern on the right. And using those little alignment screws that I showed you before, we will get an approximate position to line up these patterns with one another. And this is done during installation and maybe checked every now and then um, to make sure it's aligned properly. And then when we go through our calibration routine in our software, we look for all of the dots on one side, all of the dots on the other side, and match them up. Um, so it's quite a complicated registration process, but it's all done without you having to worry about it. In this view, this is the expert mode view. There are also some advanced um, options that you can use, but we're not going to go into them today. I'm just going to show you very, very simply how the system works. OK, so let's go through sort of normal operation. We come in, everything turns green in our hardware setup screen. And then what we do is we click on the orange tab. And that takes us to live. The system will go through its calibration routine. You might be able to hear it clicking and clunking a little bit. And what it does there is it goes through every disk position and every um, filter cube position and matches up all of the uh, dots. I'm just going to turn down the light source on this sample because, as I say, it's extremely bright. OK, so what we now have, we now have a wide field image. So we can focus through this kidney sample. So this is the DAPI channel, the GFP channel. And a, let me just bring that down and a DS red channel. OK, so as you can see, it looks like a conventional wide field blurry image. But if we engage the confocal mode, so that's doing the, the subtraction, then we see that our image gets much crisper. OK, so I'm just um, moving through Z so you can see the Z stack. Um, it's a little bit jumpy, I think, on the final video, but um, where I am, it's quite smooth. Um, so I'm just going to pause this and show you um, the flow chart of operations, and then I'll show you just how to do a very simple Z stack and show you how easy it is. So up the top here, um, where you see my cursor, I hope, if I click on this region, this will open um, Windows Explorer. So we can um, go in here, we can type in whatever um, file path and file name we want. Now, most importantly, I'm going to call this mouse kidney. But when I actually acquire some data, it will be called mouse kidney and it will be appended with a date and a timestamp. So you can never overwrite your data by accident. It will always be saved as a unique file name. Um, so that's all taken care of for you in the background. The next tab down, this is our XY navigator. So if I just move very um, uh, small amounts, you can see that 
our XY stage is responding. And if I wanted to do, for example, a tile scan, I can just drag and drop a region of interest and that will set up our tile scan. So it's extremely simple to, to do tile scans or multiple regions of interest in this software. The next part down is where we set up our Z-Stack, which I'll do in a second for you. This part here is for our resolution. So this is where we choose our disk position. Um, we choose how aggressive we want to section our image. I'll show you the effect of that in a second. Here is our filter cubes. Um, so this is the different filter cube positions that we have in the turret. This is if we want to do time lapse or videos for our live cell imaging. And then you will have seen me very quickly turning down the camera exposure time and the light source settings for this sample because it's very, very bright. Um, so as you can see, you have plenty of light with an LED light source. We're only running at 20 milliseconds and 12% lamp intensity. And even that is probably a little bit too aggressive for this particular sample. OK, so I'm going to go back into live mode. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to show you the effect of the sectioning modes. So at the moment, we're in the high signal mode. So it's letting through a, a, a lot of light. I'm just going to up this a little bit. It will show the effect a bit better. So we see here that we're letting through a lot of light, but you also see a little bit of the outer focus light coming through. This mode is extremely useful if you have a, a thick specimen and you want to um, do quite coarse sectioning through it, or perhaps your, your sample is very weak and you want to just gather as much light as you possibly can. So this is using the apertures in the disk that are far apart, so it's letting through more light. If I move the disk now into the um, medium sectioning, this is kind of a, a one size fits all sectioning mode. So this is, this is the middle section of the disk, and it's a good compromise between light throughput and sectioning capability. And then if I go down to the high sectioning mode, this is where um, you would use your bright, thin samples. So this is, this is great for getting your highest resolution at the sacrifice of losing a little bit of light. Um, so this, this one, um, I, I believe, and we must may correct me, is around one area unit. Um, and then as we go up, we slightly open the, if you're familiar with pinholes, open the pinhole a little bit. Um, so it really depends on what resolution you, you wish to have from your system. Now, there are, there are some really good talks coming up. Um, Professor Mark Neal is going to talk about um, sectioning, how to measure it, and uh, all the different methods for measuring um, actual response and Z resolution and things like that. So it's definitely worth you coming to that talk because it should be quite interesting. OK, so just to show you the difference between the finest sectioning and the wide field image, you can see that there is a, a really, really big jump between wide field and confocal going back and forth. So you can see that we're really rejecting an awful lot of out of focus light when we go into our most aggressive sectioning. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you how to do a, a quick three color Z stack, um, which is what most people want to do. So first of all, I would go to my first channel. So I'm going to go to the DAPI channel. I'm just going to it's bleached a little bit. So maybe we go to a different field of view. La, la, la. Let's go over here, maybe. And maybe only the medium. There we go. So our DAPI channel. This sample's getting a little bit old now, so our DAPI's bleached a little bit. OK, so what I want to do is I just want to choose a suitable exposure time. So you do that just by pulling this um, slider back and forth and choosing choosing a suitable one. I think 100 milliseconds for this channel is suitable at this, this lamp intensity. We could also increase the lamp intensity and reduce the camera exposure time if we wished. Um, if we were having trouble seeing this channel, I could also use binning. Um, so you could, you could locate your sample a little bit more. And if you had a very noisy sample, you could do camera averaging. And obviously at the um, expense of your frame rate. So once we've chosen our exposure time and our lamp intensity for that channel, we go to the next channel, which is the green one. And just bring this down. OK, so here's a very bright channel. So, um, we're just going to use 20 milliseconds, 
12% lamp intensity. And when I'm looking at the brightness of the channel, I'm looking at this histogram that maybe I'll explain a little bit about in a second. So once I'm happy with the exposure time for this channel, I'll go to the third one. And maybe, yeah, this looks okay. All right, so maybe we could give that a little bit more exposure time. So each channel can have different exposure time, different light source intensity, um, depending on the brightness of the particular channel. So now I want to set up my Z, Z stack. So I'm just going to use the, the focus knob on the microscope to do this. And you want to take a look at this Z area where we're going to set up the Z stack, so near the top. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to move the, uh, the, the knob on the focus drive down to the bottom of my sample. And if you hover over these um, little icons, you will always get a little thing pop up. So I'm going to click on this left-hand green chevron where it says set bottom. I'm going to click on that. So that's my bottom of my Z stack setup. Now I'm going to move through my sample to the top go to the set top green chevron on the right. So now I have my Z range set up in the software. Now here, I, I'm going to do 16 micron stack, and I'm going to do it in 0 0.8 micron steps. Now you can change this if you want to. Say we wanted to do half micron steps, and say we wanted to do uh, 12 micron stack. We can edit these numbers if you want to. So when we've set up our parameters, what we do is we click on this hexagon and it turns it yellow. So the rationale behind the software is anything that's turned yellow, you follow the lines round, it will be acquired when you click this yellow triangle here. This is the acquire button. Now I know when I want to do a three channel experiment, so I just select these filter cues by clicking on the corner. So these turn yellow as well. So if you look, we've got 25 slices, and we're going to do a three-channel Z-stack. So I'll just go ahead and click on the yellow button, and it will go ahead and acquire that data for us. So as you see, you can get going with a Z-stack really, really quickly, um, and it will, it will take your data um, just in a minute or so. So this is a good point while it's acquiring the data. Um, if there are any particular questions or if anyone needs me to go over something, um, then we can, we can do that. I'm just having a quick look at the chat folder right now. Uh, oh, it looks like, uh, looks like Remus and Lee are. Oh, sorry, Daniel, does, did you say, um, Am I too quiet or too loud? I just had a private message from Daniel saying to change my mic settings. I'll check that. I'm sorry if I'm not um, being heard very clearly. Um, so um, once the uh, data acquisition has, has completed, we move from um, the acquire button down to this blue button which is inspect mode and here we can play through oh I changed the uh, lookup table a little bit too aggressively there we go um, here we can change we can play through our data just to check that everything's working okay and if we're happy with the look of our data if we've done a tile scan and a time lapse we could also play through the time lapse and the different positions as well if we're happy with the way that our data looks, if we come up to the top of the window again, um, if you just click on that file name, and as you can see, it's got appended with this date and timestamp. So you, if you clicked acquire again, you would not accidentally overwrite your data. It would always be saved properly. You click on this file name, and what it will do is it will launch a version of Fiji image J. Um, this, this computer's working quite hard at the moment, so it might take a little while to, uh, to open. Um, here we go, it's coming. Okay, so what it will do is it will um, bring up your data in ImageJ Fiji, um, and then you can carry on 
working on on your sample so um, you have all your um, metadata for the different channels um, saved here that you can look at um, and your nice three channel image is read in correctly with the correct um, metadata so we have this one click export um, into image j um, but also our, our data is exported in an omi tiff format um, which makes it extremely easy to read into different post-processing software packages. So you can use Imaris, you can use media cybernetic software, you can export the data into Avia um, from DR Vision, who are now owned by Leica. Um, so any of your favorite post-processing packages will be able to read in our data in the correct format. Um, and if you have something special that you want to use, then um, we can... Uh, probably accommodate it because the omitted format is a universal format. Okay, so um, that's all I wanted to show you, just a really brief um, overview of how the instrument works and how to get a Z-Stack. Um, but I'm more than happy to show people um, any more features or drill down into more detail if you want. So um, feel free to ask me to show anything again if you if you want to so i'll just stop sharing for a little while um so lee perhaps you can let me know if any questions came in regarding um wanting to see anything again or if anyone wants something highlighted again Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, sorry, my, my microphone wouldn't switch off. No, that's um, fine. I was just trying to read down the... Um, the... Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think we generally sort of um, covered things. Uh, I mean, I tried to... Re Rima sat here with me <laughs> dictating some of the responses because okay. uh, uh, I think at one point he couldn't, couldn't keep up. <laughs> um, so I think we think we've answered all the questions as we've gone along. Okay, um, that sounds great. Um, yeah, so if anybody wants me to go over anything um, in more detail, I'll be more than happy to. Um, oh, okay, so a question from Peter Call. Um, how do we use a triple cube, for, for example, via our software? So, uh, Peter, you're going to have to wait um, in the visionary software until our next um, release, which is coming um, a little bit later this summer. Um, so, visionary 5 will allow you to have a multiple multiple band um, filter cube within the clarity and and be able to use the LED light source to change the wavelength of light for the excitation light. Um, so at the moment, uh, people that are using multiple band filters are using Micromanager or Metamorph or Cockpit um, because the way you can set up channels is much more complicated um, in those software packages. Um, and it's much more flexible. So we're implementing that at the moment. Um, so you'll be able to use your quad band filter, for example, um, in, in the visionary software. And then the, the look and feel of the software would be exactly the same. You still have your four channels, but instead of changing the filter cube position, it would change the LED on the light source. Um, so this would work, for example, with the PE4000 light source or something like the Spectra X light source. Um, okay, we had a, a, a question from Diana. Um, it'd be nice to see a colorblind mode included. Um, yes, um, that's been raised a couple of times actually, being able to change the lookup table um, on our visualization. Um, yeah, what we tend to do is we tend to work on customer requests for our software development. So as people um, give us feature requests and things like that, then we implement them in order. Um, it's definitely something that, that is on the list to be done. We, we haven't so far had a user that has color blindness. Um, if we did, then we would definitely bump that up the possibility. Um, but yeah, changing the lookup table in visionary is, is actually a little bit difficult. Um, so it might be easier to use one of the other implementations in Micromanager or Metamorph um, at the start if you had a user 
that that, that did have color blindness. Um, and then we can look to change that in the visionary software. But at the moment, we, we don't have the option to change it, um, although it is on the feature list. OK. Um, Mika, did, uh, did Remus not answer that question about grid sizes? OK, we'll take that offline and um, make sure that 